Hello. I'm back, although maybe from the look of the picture you're looking at, you might want to just close the, your eyes and listen to my voice instead of watching, because I had trouble with the camera. It's really hard when you're juggling a camera and trying to figure out if you're in the middle of where you're supposed to be. So anyway, here we are, the Canadian West Collection. Beyond the Gathering Storm, we're in Chapter 6. And I'll dive right in. The location of the detachment had not been chosen because it was a larger, prominent prairie town. Its claim to an RCMP office was its central position in the area that needed to be patrolled. Amid miles and miles of stark prairie and more miles of empty foothills sat this little town directly in the middle. The distances no longer had to be covered on horseback, though Henry knew there would be days during the winter when he would long once more for a good dog team and a sled. Many roads in the best of weather posed difficulty even for the high-built Fords. He dreaded the winter storms and spring rains, but they'd have to deal with those when the time came. For the moment, it was enough to face and manage what came up day by day. He rubbed at the tension in the back of his neck. Though it had been a routine day, which to a police officer was always an advantage, he still had reports to write up. He was hungry. But the thought of food at the local cafe did not entice him. Everything they served was so highly spiced, it made his stomach complain. Rogers, his fellow officer, joked, If it didn't taste like fire, it'd have no taste at all. But it was either setting for cafe fare, or the impossible task of rustling up something in his bachelor quarters. He had been at his new posting in the South for three weeks. Three weeks. It didn't sound long, yet it felt like forever. It was so different from the North. He had been watching and observing to catch the feel of the whole flow of life here from his two fellow officers. Even so, he felt he was constantly on the brink of making some major faux, official faux pas. So far he had managed to cover his hesitancy and fear of going up against what was culturally acceptable. Canadian law was the law of the West. He would uphold the law as he had vowed and been trained to do. But the details, the things that swung on individual interpretation, or the issues that could stump him. The force had a reputation to uphold, an image to protect. Henry was very conscious of that fact. He lived and breathed with the force in mind. He rubbed his neck with more vigor. I'm not sure I was cut out for this, ran relentlessly through his mind. He silently noted, I feel like I'm walking on a beaver dam in spring flood water. I'm not quite sure where to place my next step. Boy, he admitted aloud, feeling the fringe at the back of his head. I've got to get a haircut. Three weeks was too long to let the regulation cut go, but... Henry had been so busy trying to figure out his new posting that he'd not had time to look up a barber. He couldn't remember seeing a striped pole in this little one-horse town. Well, there must be somebody who cuts hair. He looked at the young constable across the room, busily scratching out his daily report. Larray, he asked. Where does one get a haircut in this town? Sam's, Larray answered without even looking up. There was a stirring at the other desk in the room. Rogers repeated, Sam's. 
he noticed the two officers exchanging a look and, and a grin. Ah, oh, they are setting me up, thought Henry. But he pretended to fall in with whatever their little scheme might be. He, the best place in town? Sam's, repeated Rogers. Definitely. Only place in town, put in LeRae with a chuckle. Wouldn't matter, no, if there were a dozen. Sam's would still be the place to go, said Rogers. Now both laughed. Do these guys think I'm dumb or what? thought Henry. But he only nodded and repeated, Sam's. With a ch final chuckle from his two companions, they all returned to their paperwork. Oh, I suppose Sam's is about on par with Jesse's grill, Henry mentally groused. Tortured stomach, tortured hair. He shrugged and went back to his reports. The sooner he finished, the sooner he'd get to Jesse's, down the spicy food and chase it with his mints for stomach acid, and head for bed. Tomorrow night, tomorrow might be a totally non-routine day. He needed to sleep what, to handle whatever might come. The three left the building together. Larray turned to lock the door behind them. Going to Jesse's? Where else? This from Rogers. Larray laughed. Yeah, where else? They fell into step. Did you find that little church you were asking about? Henry knew the question was directed to him. I did. So how's it going? Fine. You might want to join us. The other two men both laughed and Larray said, Not me. I was done with church when my pa wasn't able to whip me any more. What's it like? queried Rogers. Small, but friendly. I think I'll like it. I've only gone once. Drew Sunday duty on the other two weekends. I don't mind Sunday duty, put in Larray. Often quieter on Sunday. Well, except for the guys who party too much on Saturday night, offered Rogers. I get awful tired of handling drunks and breaking up fights. Henry had thoughts of his own on the subject, but he kept them to himself. They walked the remainder of the day in silence. Even the smell of Jesse's grill was hot and spicy. They were nodded to a table by Jesse. She came over herself, her grin revealing the missing tooth. Somehow in Jessie's face it seemed to fit. She was, well, she was rather rugged in appearance. Brassy red hair was pulled back from bony cheeks in a bedraggled hair ribbon. The bright red lipstick applied somewhat carelessly, matched in tone the bright rouge spot on her sallow cheeks. Her strident voice seemed to match her looks. Already, though, Henry had sensed that the people of the community had respect for Jessie. She'd had a touch go, tough go, but she wasn't looking for favors or handouts. She worked day and night, but she was making it on her own. Henry knew there must have been a Mr. Jessie somewhere in the past, the, the only evidence of him now was the handful of little Jessies he'd spotted here and there. He had not asked questions about the family, but expected to learn more in time. His eyes searched her face as she stood, stood by their table. He felt sorry for the woman and her obviously difficult circumstances. What you got cooking tonight, Jessie? asked the Ray good-naturedly. There really wasn't need for the food-spattered menus she pushed toward them. The regulars had each eaten, each item already memorized. Special is beef stew and baking powder biscuits, she said. She turned her head away to cough. The stew would be nothing like his mother's, but Henry ordered it anyway. Make it too, 
three. While Jesse went to dish up, Henry stretched out his legs. Either of you happen to know of a cheap place a fellow might rent? I might like to batch. Batch? Man, I'd hate that, said Larray. I hate to eat my own cooking. Well, I think I'd hate to eat your cooking too, joked Rogers. Henry had other thoughts. He didn't mind cooking at all. He had almost enjoyed it while in the north, and he'd had precious little to cook with there. The nearby corner store here would make things much easier. Besides, he knew his own cooking would be much easier on his digestive system. Well, I don't know of anything right off. If I hear of anything, I'll let you know. Rogers responded. I know this guy in real estate. I'll ask him if you'd like. I'd appreciate it, said Henry. Their plates arrived. Other patrons came and went. Henry was very aware of eyes on the uniform. Uniforms. One rough-looking cowboy glared at them. Probably had spent a night locked up for some infraction of the law. Others ducked their heads. A few young girls cast interested glances their way. Older women and town businessmen nodded in an acknowledgment. The presence of the force brought stability to towns like theirs. Henry was only too glad to finish the stew. After his last drink of bitter coffee, he rose. Might be a little late in the morning, he said, running a hand over his hair be before placing his Stetson. Gotta get that this haircut. Where do I find this fella, Sam? Sam's is just off Main Street, corner of Main and Fourth, second building south. Oh, what, what time does he start? Henry did not miss the exchange between the two other officers. 8.30. Thanks, said Henry with a nod. Already he was planning to be the first one in the door when Sam flipped his sign to open. But when he arrived at 8.15, the chair was already occupied by a very young boy. Henry ruefully removed his Stetson and hung it on the wrap, hat rack. He hoped this would be worth the wait. If the other two got their hair cut by Sam, as they claimed, he should fare all right. Take a seat. I'll be right with you. A woman called. He'd never found a barber shop with a receptionist before. He took a seat and picked up a day old paper. The headlines announced conflict across the Atlantic. Food lines and railroad hobos. More farms and businesses fighting for survival in the Prairie Dust Bowl. Henry sighed and put the bad news down. He heard a step and then the voice again. Here you go. Give this to Mrs. Crane. She's going to the meat market and promised to get some sausage for Mommy. The boy hopped down from his perch and disappeared through the back doorway. Now run straight home. Henry heard his giggle. I'm not going home, Mom. I'm going to Mrs. Crane's house. Remember? There was laughter in the voice that responded. I meant home to Mrs. Crane's. Here, kiss me by. He heard the little smack. Now run. Henry picked up the paper again. He did not want to intrude on this private moment. Bye, Mom, the child called as he bounded out the door. Henry concentrated on the paper as the woman entered the room. He should be next, providing Sam probably her husband, was on site. She was arranging some tools on the small shelf near the barber chair. From the corner of his eye he noticed her lift a black barber cape. You're next, she announced. I was, I, I was looking for Sam, he managed to croak out as he put the paper aside and stood. I'm Sam, 
came the voice from behind the cape. He was totally taken aback. You give haircuts? Well, that's what the sign says. Her tone was crisp. He moved awkwardly toward the chair. Uh, just a standard regimental cut, he heard himself saying as he settled into it. I understand, she replied, her voice still school cool. I've done a good many cuts for the force. Of course. If she was the only barber in town, she had been giving the men their haircuts. I guess you have, he mumbled, being the only barber here. Look, she replied stiffly, you don't like my haircut? You can drive into Fort McCloyd. He lifted his eyes to the large mirror reflecting the scene in the shop, and he saw her face for the first time. She was standing directly behind him, her hands holding the cape, and her expression questioning whether to proceed or send him on his way. No, I didn't mean... Oh, sorry, go ahead, please. Her hands swished the cape over his shoulder and shoulders, and the woman leaned forward to fashion it firmly. He got his first full look at her face. A mass of curly brown hair framed an oval face with a slight dimple in one smooth cheek, and she had a pair of the loveliest violet eyes. It was those eyes that confirmed the truth to him. He knew with a surety, surety that sent his head and heart reeling. This was she. This was the young woman he had been sent to almost five years earlier. This was the Swedish logger's young widow. Henry fought to control his swirling emotions. He was totally unprepared for this sudden encounter. Chapter 7 Christine was thrilled to note the early signs of spring. Though dirty snow still lined the sidewalks, where the sun's rays were unable to reach, the water trickling along in the gutters could almost sound like the streams in her beloved north country. She closed her eyes for a moment to enjoy the pleasant memory. Well, said Christine to herself, opening her eyes to continue her walk to work, running waters is running waters. Even here in the street, it still makes wonderful music. She wondered if any workers hurling along, hurrying along ahead of her had noticed the sound. She clung to her especially light frame of mind as she, almost by habit, entered the big building, climbed the stairs, and turned to her right. The same routine, the same duties, the same Miss Stout faced her as she opened the office door. The woman had stopped wearing her lacy hankies and fancy pins on her labels. Apparently she'd given up on Mr. Kingsley. Christine thought the receptionist car carried her own little halo with her. Not a halo of light, but one of cloud. It had drifted about her head and wrapped around her shoulders. I am a lonely spinster, it seemed to say. I am unappreciated unloved. Miss Stout, on occasion, withdrew even more deeply into her groom, groom, into her gloom, and wrapped it about her thin body. Christine did hope this wouldn't be one of those days. She did not have time to hang up her coat before Miss Stout said, Mr. Kingsley wishes to speak with you. Her tone, her words were terse, and Christine Christine could imagine that cloud being tucked in tightly. Thank you, Miss Stout, she answered brightly, hoping to share a bit of her spring happiness. She did not bother to go for her steno pad. If she needed it, she'd come back. None of the other girls had arrived yet, so there would be no observers of the early morning visit to the boss's office. She rapped on the door and opened it. You wish to see me? The shaggy head swung her way. You here already? Christine felt the query did not need a reply. Sit, the man said. She sat. He pushed his chair back, then changed his mind and leaned forward. 
I know where your answer was no, and I'm not out to change that. At the same time, he raised a hand to forestall any words she might be inclined to say. However, he hesitated. I was wondering if you'd object to making another supper, J just one. He lifted the hand again, this time palm up. Christine gave the matter thought, then nodded silently. Good. He exhaled, exhaled loudly, and pushed back again, looking very pleased. Christine's immediate thoughts went to Miss Stout. The woman would be overjoyed. When? she asked simply. Friday. This Friday. I'll do all the shopping. Just give me a list. Friday, she nodded. Fine. Is there anything in particular? particular you'd like me to serve? I have little experience with any fancy dishes. Oh, fancy dishes we don't need. Just some of the chicken and dumplings you served before. That was wonderful. But, but don't you think your guests might enjoy something, well, different this time? Nope, nope. He'll love that. I know he will. He? Who was her boss referring to? It's to be a surprise. I haven't told him a thing about it. Whatever the plan and whoever the guest, Mr. Kingsley seemed tremendously excited. How many for supper? Asked Christine. Just us. Two. And you, of course. I want you to sit with us this time. Me? I, went, I want it like, like a family meal instead of you serving like a maid. Christine swallowed and nodded again. If you wish. He, bon he beamed. Well, that's all set then. You just get me that list. What if I go ahead and get what I need and you simply reimburse me? Oh, that's good. That's great. I never did like the shopping. He sounded relieved. Christine rose. Friday, she said, as she turned to the door. Friday, her boss agreed obviously very pleased with himself. Oh, he called after her. You can plan on the meal being ready about seven. Boyd won't be back home until then. Christine nearly stopped in mid-stride. Boyd? So now she was to be cooking a meal for the boss's son? For some reason she could not have explained her heart suddenly began to beat much faster. Christine was in the large kitchen, nervously fussing over the final preparations for the meal, when Boyd arrived. She could hear Mr. Kingsley's booming voice welcoming her son home from college. His son home from college. It made her even more anxious. She wasn't sure she'd be able to keep her hands from trembling as she served. Boy, that's the longest trip. Christine could not pick up the rest of Boyd's word. She heard both men laugh uproariously and wondered what the joke was. With a final flutter of nerves, she picked up two filled serving bowls and proceeded to the dining room. Quickly, her eyes scanned the table. She had tried hard to make the table setting attractive without being too feminine. She wondered now if it seemed overdone, a, a bit showy for two bachelors. Quickly she removed the two candles in their tall crystal holders. Still she was uncertain. The fanned napkins were the next to go. She shook them out and then folded them and laid them beside the plates. That helped, but she was sure her Aunt Mary would have been disappointed. She had lived with Uncle John and Aunt Mary in their Calgary home while she took the secretarial course. During that time, she had begged to be taught the niceties of city life that would prepare her for being a hostess in an urban setting. Though her mother had taught through the accepted manners of genteel society, her upbringing in the North had placed her far beyond the range of city social customs. Aunt Mary had been happy to teach her the duties of a charming hostess, along with the decorative touches that helped to make a memorable meal. Christine had been put under Cook's tutelage in the kitchen. Oh, she had loved it. In fact, at one point she had even considered becoming a chef instead of continuing her secretarial training. 
Her practical nature had kept her on track, however. There were far more positions available for secretaries than for chefs. Now she fidgeted with the cutlery and rearranged the water glasses. Was the crystal too much? She heard the voices drawing close and guessed that Mr. Kingsley was gradually leading his son toward the dining room. Oh, there was no more time for fussing. She reached up to truck a, tuck a stray curl away, and then they were in the doorway. Mr. Kingsley pushed his tall son ahead of him while he chortled in pleasure. My little surprise, he bawled gleefully, got us a cook. Christine felt her cheeks burn. The young man was more handsome than she had remembered. His eyes studied her openly, his eyes indicating his own pleasure. You remember Miss Delaney? Mr. Kingsley had not s ceased slapping his son on the back, rather worse than the tapping pencil. Boyd nodded. Christine noticed the twinkle in his eyes. Who could forget? he said with a courtly little bow and a smile at her. Who could forget? That's good. Who could forget? Mr. Kingsley thumped his son's back again. Well, I'll tell you one thing. You won't forget the chicken and dumplings. No siree. Excuse me, said Christine, flushed and a bit uncertain. I need to finish dishing up. May I help? Boyd's question surprised her. No, no, thank you. I'll just, I'll... She gave up and hurried from the room. Let's sit down, she heard Mr. Kingsley say. She'll be right in. Christine managed to get the rest of the food into serving bowls and without spilling or dropping anything. After finally sitting down herself, she looked to Mr. Kingsley, wondering if he would offer a table grace, but he just said, What are we waiting for? Let's eat. As he, grasped, as he grabbed up the nearest bowl. It was a rather boisterous meal, though Christine had very little, little to contribute to the conversation. She wished she could have eaten in the kitchen as she had done before. She heard many lively stories about university life. and Then she realized that few of the stories had anything to do with classes or study. Most of them were of sporting events and dorm pranks. So how are your courses coming? Mr. Kingsley eventually asked. Still think you'd like going into Walt Law? Oh, didn't I tell you? I dropped that field. Mr. Kingsley lifted his head. No, he said, I don't think you told me. Sorry, I uh, guess I was just so involved, but there didn't seem to be any true contrition in his tone. When did you make the switch? First of the semester. And uh, what did you switch to? I don't know yet. Still haven't decided. I think journalism might be interesting. Mr. Kingsley nodded, his eyes questioning. But his voice was still even interested as he said, Journalism? He nodded. Sounds good. Boyd turned to Christine and complimented her on the dumplings. Mr. Kingsley interrupted with, The girl's a wonder in the kitchen. Sure beats those second-rate restaurants you usually take me to, joked Boyd. Christine flushed again. Have you had any course in journalism? Mr. Kung Kingsley picked up the previous conversation. Oh, not yet. Didn't want to jump into it in the middle of a semester. But you were taking classes, right? Oh, right. I finished up a couple of arts classes. Arts? General. They will apply to almost anything I decide to take. So you've only got a couple of classes. Well, I have another one from the first semester. I thought you took a full load your first semester. Well, yeah, I started out that way. Some of them were just youth, useless rubbish. I dropped a couple. Ended up with only one I could use. Christine felt very uncomfortable. She wished she did not have to sit in on this exchange. 
Even so, the two seemed most amiable. No criticism on the part of the father. No apology or embarrassment on the part of the son. Takes a while to get settled into university life, Boyd went on. You sort of have to find your way. Mr. Kingsley agreed, seeming quite willing to accept his son's word for it. Well, next year you'll know what to expect, more what you want. You can work it out then. Boyd nodded and asked for the plate of chickens. Save plenty of room for dessert. I had Miss Delaney make your favorite chocolate cream pie. I got a whiff of it. You'll want more than one piece, I'm sure. After the meal, the men stretched out in front of the blazing fire in the drawing room, and Christine hurried off to clean up the kitchen. She had no objection to riding the city's electric streetcars, but she did not feel comfortable being out alone too late at night. Had she been in the north, she would not have given the late hour a second thought. Christine felt much safer in the north than in the unfamiliar city. Come, come sit and visit, invited Mr. Kingsley, extending a hand to her when she stepped into the room to bid them a good night. Oh, no, thank you. I must get on home. I'm not even sure how late the trolley runs. Trolley? Oh, no trolley, no need. Boyd can take you in his car. Come and sit a while. Christine felt she had no choice in the matter. Reluctantly, she laid aside her coat and went to join them. The younger man slid over on the couch and patted the seat beside him. With flushed cheeks, Christine accepted the invitation. So, has my father been treating you all right? teased the young man. Mr. Kingsley laughed outright. Christine did not attempt an answer, feeling that none was really expected. I tried to get her to move in here, said Mr. Kingsley. Room and board in exchange for a meal now and then. Boyd looked at her closely, making her blush further. Sounds like a good plan to me. Well, it didn't sound like a good plan to her. She turned me down. Christine could feel two sets of eyes trained upon her. It made her most uncomfortable. I just didn't think it would look right, she managed. Told her she could bring some other woman along, the father explained. I really have no, no other woman to bring, Christine defended herself. You could always bring old bones, Boyd, in, Boyd put in. At Christine's frown, he quickly amended the comment. Oops, I guess I should say Miss Stout. Miss Stout? Old bones? Christine was shocked at the young man's lack of respect. But his father only chuckled. I do not believe Miss Stout would be interested in moving to a com making a move to accommodate me, Christine said, trying to keep her tone matter-of-fact. Boyd smiled and shifted, stretching long legs across the heavy carpet. Ha! Oh, I think Miss Stout would use any excuse available to be able to move in here, he said, raising an eyebrow somewhat cynically. I really must be going, Christine said as she stood to her feet. Mr. Kingsley nodded. Reckon the boy's a bit tired tonight, too. He's had a long day of travel. Soon the two were out in the cool night air, headed toward Boyd's automobile. Christine took a deep breath. It felt good to be fairly hidden in the darkness. Boyd opened the car door and helped her into the vehicle. How many times a week do you favor us with a meal? he asked as he started the engine. Oh, no, this was a single event. Your father wanted to surprise you with a meal at home on your first night. I'm disappointed, he said, and he sounded sincere. It was a delightful surprise, and I was hoping it would be repeated regularly. If you, you're quite sure we can't persuade you? Christine stammered for a reply. She couldn't find much to offer in the way of an argument. He was so gentlemanly, so confident and 
smooth. She felt like a backwood bumpkin by comparison. The car purred effortless, effortless. The car purred effortlessly along the empty streets. He asked, What do you find to do in this cow town? What do you do for entertainment? Entertainment? Don't tell me your fa my father doesn't leave you time for pleasure. Surely he doesn't work you all the time. Oh, no. I have every evening free. And you? He prompted. I read. Read? The way he said the word made it sound like nothing could be more boring. I love to read, she said defensively. You know, he said with a laugh, if you'll allow me, I can guarantee I can find something for you that's a lot more exciting than that. Christine did not answer. They pulled up in front of her boarding house, but before she could express her thanks and open her door, he reached over and took her hand. How about it? he pressed. I I must really get in. He had not let go of her hand, and she knew her heart was racing. You haven't answered my question. Well, it, it, would, it would depend, she said. I wouldn't, I couldn't give a final answer. I have no idea what you might have in mind. I'd have to decide. His chuckle interrupted her words. So it's not a straight out no. That's a comfort. He gave her hand a squeeze. Then I guess it's up to me to find something you'd agreed to do, right? She nodded, then realized it was too dark in the auto for him to see her. Right, she managed. He lifted her hand and gently kissed her fingers. I accept the challenge. Christine hurriedly withdrew her hand and scrambled from the car. She was visibly shaking as she made her way up the walk. She did hope she would meet no one in the hallway on the way to her room. Oh, my dear. Okay, that's it for today. I am going to have to work on that picture, aren't I? My picture trying to make it smaller but I can't get the picture side bigger so I can be smaller and have more up and down motion. I'll have to talk to Larry. Maybe he'll help me. So tomorrow will be chapter 8 and we're going to be back with Henry. Okay? So long now.